Namaste. I was chatting with a friend last night, and he was telling me about all his problems and frustrations and stuff. And I realized he's suffering because he doesn't have right view. And this is the reason why not only he's suffering, but everybody in the material world, you know, 99% of everybody is suffering because they're trying to do everything from the wrong point of view. So I thought I would make this little video to help him out and to help out all the others who maybe don't have time to go through this whole uh, channel and uh, or who doesn't have the uh, ability to correct their own view, then I want to set out the terms or the, the essential points of right view in this video and then in subsequent videos go through them in more detail. So the Buddha's Eightfold Noble Path uh, is a step-by-step -step way to approach enlightenment and it's very significant that the first step of the Eightfold Noble Path is right view. <laughs> So, without right view, if you don't pass that one, you're not going to get the others. And right concentration or, or meditation is actually the last of the Eightfold uh, Steps. So, if you don't get the first one, how are you going to get the last one? Huh? So, that means if you have wrong view, you will not be successful in meditation and you will not be able to attain enlightenment. So get right view, okay? <laughs> so what is right view? Well, first of all, you have to understand about how to look at the world. In other words, most of us look at the world in terms of stories that we have been told by others. And this is theory. Huh? But then we have our experience or the actual things that happen in our life. And usually the problem is we cling to these stories, these theories that we have been given by others. And we don't listen to our experience. And because of this, we fail again and again. In Texas, they have a funny saying. If you do what you've done, you'll get what you got. <laughs> what is that? A very succinct expression of scientific method. What does a scientist do? What is scientific method? Scientists based on theory. So you have a theory, which is a story that helps you model and predict how the world works and what's going to happen. So then you take your theory and you go into the lab and you test it. You do an experiment. And if the experiment fails, guess what? Throw the theory out. Start all over again. Revise your theory, test it, and so on, until you find the truth. What really works. If you keep doing experiments that, based on a false theory, huh, they will always fail. If you keep doing activities based on a wrong story about the world, they will always fail. So what do you have to do? Like a scientist. If your stories don't work, if your theories don't work, if your ontology is incorrect, your model of the world, your understanding of how things work, no biggie. Change your theory. Uh, modify your ontology. Go back in the lab and try it again. 
until you find something that works. Now, the Chinese, I Ching, talks about the world. And it says, the world is an empty place that keeps on changing. What does that mean? It means the world is a process. It's not a thing. It's more like a living being. How can I explain it? The world is like a series of stages. Or as it's, as it's modeled in astrology, a set of houses. And different characters go in and out of those houses and have encounters and different experiences. So the world isn't actually a thing. It's like a set of spaces or categories or steps in a process. And then energies and beings and consciousness and concepts and all kinds of stuff is going through these different stages or these different houses and constantly changing. So we don't know really what's going to happen. Anything can happen. There are no rules, ultimately. So any principles that we do discover are usually limited in their scope or context of applicability. Still, we can establish certain things that are always true. What are they? Well, first of all, change. The material world is based on time, and time means change. Huh? How do we measure time? By the way things change. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. Summer, fall, winter, spring, the seasons change. Huh? Nowadays, with the crazy weather, who knows <laughs> what seasons are going to happen. But still, we measure time by change. Because there is time, there is change. Therefore, the material world is impermanent. This is the first big truth. It's called the three characteristics in Buddhism. That the world and everything in it is impermanent, always changing, and ultimately, there are no rules about how it's going to change. So what does that mean? That means that we have to be very alert to how the world is changing. It doesn't work like clockwork. Now, some things do, uh, but most things don't, especially people, relationships, the mind stuff like that. So we have to be aware of this and be ready for it. Our theories, no matter how good they are, can stop working any second. And then we have to revise them so they do work. So if we keep on this process, we eventually come up with the general conclusion and what is that? This world is not I. Big idea of the day, right? The world is different from myself. And why is that? I can't control it. Maybe to a certain extent I can control. But many things are completely beyond my control or even my understanding. So this world is not myself. This world is not I. Generally speaking, we think of I as something that we can control, that we have influence over. Huh? Our degree of possession of something is based on our ability to control it. So the world is beyond our control it is not ourself. I mean, in a higher way it is, but we'll, 
We'll get to that later. It's certainly the world is not the ego. The world is not the mind. It has no obligation to obey us or even to, to be predictable by us. Therefore, the third big idea is the world is unsatisfactory, dukkha, or suffering. Suffering means there's a mismatch between my desires and what happens. Huh? We're back at the scientist in the lab again. He tries his theory, it fails. <laughs> Throw out the theory, <laughs> cook up a new one. So, because of this suffering, and ultimately we have to die and be reborn, and we don't want to do that. All these things are suffering, and they're all because of desire. Desire, the unsatisfactoriness of the results that we get from our actions, the fact that the world is unpredictable, unsustainable, and not self. See, these things are all related. So because of this, we have to accept the fact that there is no objective reality. All the stories we've been told about the world are wrong. In fact, it's one of the great embarrassing secrets of science and philosophy that the objective existence of the world cannot be proven. Why is that? <laughs> because science cannot find another world to compare it to. I mean, the world is the universe and everything, right? So is there another universe? If there is, we, we have no way to access it. We may theorize about it, but those theories always turn up wrong. There's no way to prove them. So we can say that the world has an objective existence, but actually it doesn't. The proof of that is our personal experience from day to day. What happens every day? We wake up in the morning and suddenly the whole world and God and everything springs into existence, isn't it? And then we go through our day and finally at night we lay down and go to sleep and we enter a different world, a completely subjective world also of dreams. And those dreams are wild, anything can happen. Uh, they're even more changeable than the material world. And finally, we enter deep sleep. And in deep sleep, both the so-called objective world of waking consciousness and the dream world of dream consciousness disappear. And we are aware of nothing. But we are aware. The world has no objective existence despite all the stories you've been told. It doesn't work that way. And that's why you are frustrated. That's why you're suffering. Because you're acting based on a false theory. So what's the real theory? And, and what do we do about this? How do we turn things around? How do we make our lives satisfying and fulfilling and happy? And the answer, of course, is yoga and self-realization. So, what is the theory of yoga? Okay, there are seven chakras. And the Chinese and Indian way of dividing them up is a little bit different, but it all works out to about the same thing. There are seven chakras going from the gross physical existence by stages up to pure spirituality, pure consciousness. So yoga, because these energy centers, chakras, huh, are vortexes of energy. We went over vortex theory 
a long time ago in some of our videos, but I'm going to touch on it again here. A vortex is basically a whirlpool, a whirlpool of energy. So that energy can be pure or impure. The whirlpool can be going slowly or quickly. Okay, and the whirlpools can be in harmony or they can be in disharmony. So yoga is a means of bringing the seven chakras, the vortexes of energy into harmony and raising the energy level to support higher states of consciousness. Just like if you have a machine. Well, the body is a machine. And it's a machine that works on energy. The more energy the machine can process, the more work it can get done and the, more, and the higher quality work it can perform. So to bring the human machine to the highest level of functioning, where it can do its best quality work, the energy levels of the chakras have to be brought to the highest stage. That's what yoga is all about. So yoga is divided into four main types. I mean, there are innumerable methods of yoga, uh, but they all fall into one or more of these four types. Karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga. So we went over these in the introduction to the esoteric uh, teaching series. And the esoteric teaching, of course, is based on Ramana Maharshi's Uladu Narpadu. And in there he talks about the four yogas as being the means of purification or raising the energy level. Okay. Karma yoga deals primarily with the first three chakras, sex, energy, and movement. And this corresponds to ordinary waking consciousness, the activities of waking consciousness. In other words, working in the world are all part of karma yoga, everything from our diet to exercise, to our livelihood, to doing charity, to doing ordinary religious activities and so on. The idea is to purify our karma and raise our energy level to the point where we can afford the higher emotional and spiritual functions. Most people's energy level is so low, they're all uh, engrossed in negativity, lust and attachment and so on, identification and oh, it's a mess. To get out of that, you need to increase your karmic bank account most people don't have enough shubha karma huh? or punya as it's called in India. You need to increase your punya. So you have to do ordinary religious activities. For example, a lot of people now are out of work. Why are you out of work? Because you have bad karma. Duh. <laughs> Remember the theory of the objective universe is false. So the, the subjective universe means that you get the world that reflects your consciousness. If your consciousness is low, and if your first three chakras, your energy, sex, and movement chakras are all out of balance and functioning at a low energy level, of course you're not going to get a job. huh? You don't have the energy for it. And even if you do get a job, you're going to be miserable because you don't have the energy to do it nicely huh? and so on. People with higher energy levels go into business. Uh, I never had a job. I always had a business. And because of that, I had complete freedom. Uh, I could work when I wanted to. And when I had enough money, I'd go off to India and study something or other and then come back. So... I had a much, much freer life than the ordinary person. Uh, why? Because my energy level was higher. I could do more and I could do it better. 
I was an expert in my field. I always got my work done on time and high quality and so forth. Why? Because my energy level was high. So in the same way, bhakti yoga, the second of the four yogas, deals with emotions. And most people are stuck in negative emotions. And well, I don't have to tell you, you already know this, huh? depression and so on. So how do you get out of that? You cultivate love of God. It's so simple. It's there in the scriptures. It's an open secret. Well, why doesn't anybody do it? Because they're listening to those false theories, those false stories that they were told about the world being an objective, uh, rational, mechanistic universe and all that crap. It's not. And even science now recognizes that fact quantum universe and so on. So get with the program, all right? <laughs> you have to change your consciousness. Bhakti yoga changes your emotions from low, gross, negative emotions to high, ecstatic emotions. Love of God. Art. Uh -huh. I've always been a very creative person. And when I was young, I was a musician a professional composer and, and recording artist. So uh, why could I do that? Because I had enough energy, I had enough karmic bank balance that I could spend the time to discipline my emotions and keep them very high. And once I began to study bhakti yoga, well, I got into ecstasy and stuff like that. Then there's Raja Yoga, the third of the four yogas. Raja Yoga is about disciplined thinking and specifically to cancel all the false identifications in the mind, to reach emptiness, shunyata. Once emptiness is reached, then jnana, the fourth stage of yoga, happens all by itself. The purpose of meditation is to clean the mind, to get that vortex of the sixth chakra working properly. And once all those chakras are aligned and they're at full uh, energy potential, then enlightenment will just happen because it's our natural state. And it's just that all the wrong working of the chakras, all the wrong theories that we've been taught, all the wrong stories, wrong identifications, and so on, in our minds are blocking it. That's all. So what we really want to do is to raise the energy level of the chakras. And how do we do that? Well, here I go off into my a very wildly unpopular but extremely effective theories that one has to reach high energy levels in the sex chakra. In fact, one has to reach the highest energy level in the sex chakra. Why? Because it is the basis of the energy of all the other chakras. If the ch sex chakra is functioning at full efficiency, all the other chakras will have abundant energy to work with. But if there's any block in the sex center, all the other chakras will be brought down to that level. So in this, I agree totally with Osho. I think he got it totally right. That one has to reach one's realized core fantasy. This is a very deep emotional and psychological uh, story, again, uh, that brings on the complete orgasm, the tantric orgasm. And usually this can only be reached by people who practice tantra over a long period of time. I was very lucky. My mother was a tantrika, and I learned the principles of tantra very early in life. And uh, I was able to practice them somehow or other. Uh, it was very difficult because most Westerners are completely idiots when it comes to sex. Um, well, most Easterners are too. <laughs> but I was able to identify my core fantasy 
and actually practice it. And I discovered these methods when I was like 12 and 13 years old, you know. So I can't talk about this very much on this channel because I'm on the Disney channel, I mean uh, YouTube. <laughs> Might as well be on Disney uh, because uh, anytime children can watch these videos and I have no way to stop them. So I can't talk about this stuff very much. But I discovered an approach to sexuality that allowed me to realize my highest energy level and uh, a full, complete orgasm while I was still, you know, less than 16 years old. And because of that, I was able to raise my other chakras to the highest energy levels as well. That's the key. That's the secret. So anyway, if you follow these ideas to their logical conclusion, you will reach self-realization spontaneously. You won't have to uh, endeavor for it. It will come all by itself. Because self-realization is the natural state. And because we've been taught a bunch of wrong things by a bunch of stupid people <laughs> who had their own interest, not our interest at heart, Therefore, uh, we are in so much trouble, we're in so much difficulty. And to counteract that, the first step and the necessary step is right view. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum.